and not enough time to say it, even though we don't really have a time limit. I mean, I, I set a three-hour time limit just because I feel like if we go longer than that, it's, we're, we're pushing into that point. Anyway, what's what's the tweet it out, and then we can all retweet it and uh, get it going. I've already hit live, dude. What the hell is your yeah, problem? but what's the link? Oh, give me a minute, man. <laughs> okay, okay. God, being all crazy, like... Oh, God. Uh, I, I also... I was looking at myself in this mirror. I started a new job like a month and a half ago. So basically I've been getting six to seven hours of sleep a night, which isn't bad, but not as much as I was getting. Um... Yeah, I can tell in my face that I am not getting enough sleep right now, and it's killing me. It is killing me. I, I, don't, I don't think I ever get enough sleep. And I'm like, shoot, I look like a wreck. But that is okay, because this is draft Twitter, where... Nobody gives a fuck. No one cares except if you're Andrew Parsons, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> There you go. There's a link. Let me let my dog, the female one, who hates her cousin, I guess you will. So, I'm going to let her out. Where is the link? He just tweeted it. Oh, all right, cool. I'm going to go and fill up a glass of Jack Daniels while he lets his dog out. I'll be right back. So, I'm alone right now. <laughs> Come on, Molly. Um... So I'm gonna. So, I just tweeted, "Come join Convention Draft Knicks," and watch us talk about a lot of draft stuff. I have tons of things that I want to talk about because I thought I was gonna have a podcast this week with Brian Joyner, who writes for the New York Times and has written for the Classical and stuff like that. Um, we're hoping to get that up next week, talking about. A uh, lot of sports stuff. He's more of a baseball guy, and I'll sort of bring the football component. Uh, but also just generally about, like, writing, about journalism, sort of, like, kind of relevant considering the conversation that happened on, I want to say, last Friday with Matt Miller, um, talking about sort of how it's important to maintain relationships and not be too critical of people uh, when you're sort of critiquing them, which I think is a really interesting conversation to have. But, so that didn't end up happening. Uh, Mecca this week. I don't know if any of you guys saw the Draft Mecca podcast. It was phenomenal this week. There were some amazing minds, and I just have to say again, um, Josh Norris, I mean, he's a friend of mine. He's awesome. Well, not a friend. We, we had pizza once, but otherwise, he's a great guy. I mean, I would consider him a friend. I don't, think, I don't know if you consider me a friend, but I like him. Darren Page is killer. Um, Keen Faye is killer. They're all killer, and they did a great job. So I would definitely recommend going on YouTube. I thought his name was Sean. Watching that, it's Keen, Kean, Kean. It's Keen. it's a hard C. But um, I gotta give him some love because they were great. Um, but overall, yeah, I just have a lot of things that I want to talk about. We haven't had this in around a month, uh, which. You know, there's a lot of things that have been festering. We could probably go position by position. We could go prospect by prospect, just go really in depth. There are certain things that I'm seeing on Twitter that are bothering me a little bit. Um, certain things that, you know, I kind of like the vibrant discussion. So it's sort of like six in one hand, half dozen in the other. Um, lots of really cool stuff going on. We're getting right into the meat of draft season two. So, uh, yeah, I'm just ready to go. I'm ready to talk. And ready to ready to kvetch. Cheers um, to that, brother. All the way. So, Benetton Benetton is not here yet. It's okay. He can so join. Hopefully, soon. he'll come on soon because Ben's a great guy. Um, but for now, Zach Gardner, Scott Karasik, Ethan Hammerman, uh, let's do this. Yes, indeed. Hmm. Well, uh, so, what what's one of those things that's been kind of Pestering that you feel. All right. I want to hear what you guys think about this. So, Teddy Bridgewater, in my mind, best quarterback in the draft. I think that's pretty much consensus, although not really. I've heard a lot of people um, 
Gil Brandt said today Johnny Manziel might be as good as Fran Tarkenton was back in the day. Uh, Blake Bortles definitely could go number one overall. The thing that bothers me, though, is I, I've watched every Teddy Bridgewater game this year. I watched every game last year. I don't see a compelling reason that separates him from where Andrew Luck was in 2012 other than the fact that Luck was a little bit taller and had better intangibles. Wait, in terms of what happens on the field, their arms are very similar. What's, they what's do the, the difference in a very similar way. Luck was and a much better downfield passer. Luck what's, didn't pass the ball downfield at Stanford. That was one of the criticisms of Luck. There were criticisms that Luck couldn't throw the ball outside the numbers at Stanford. That was probably the largest criticism that Luck had coming out in 2012. Hold on, and, hold on, hold on, hold on. What were the intangible questions? I'm not understanding what these intangible questions were about Bridgewater. How does Luck have better intangibles than Bridgewater? I have no idea. That seems to be the vibe. I've heard um, not a leader on Bridgewater. I've heard soft on Bridgewater. I've heard weak on Bridgewater. To me, Teddy Bridgewater is a guy... How many of these people who are, you know, talking crap about his intangibles actually know the guy and are in a position to speak on him? Probably very few. So, you know, I don't really take too much of that. Like, to me, Teddy's a guy who plays in an NFL system that requires him to go up to the line and make adjustments before each play. Like, those are all the intangibles that I need to see from him. Let's put it this way. Jaguar scouts have told me that they love him because of his intangibles, because of his ability to pass. He's If he's there at three, he's the pick. I mean, let's just... Let's just put this out there. He's going to be the third overall pick. Let's not just overthink this one. We do it every year. We always overthink a pick. You know, we're going to overthink number one. We're going to overthink number two. We're going to be like, you know what number two should be? Sammy Watkins. No, it should be this guy. No, it'll end up being a trade to about four because Cleveland's an idiot. They're going to trade up for Manziel, because they're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, let's be honest here. I don't even dislike Manziel. I wouldn't take him over Teddy, though. I, I think that would be a short-sighted move. But that's... It's Cleveland. I wouldn't take him over Teddy, Bortles, or Carr. It's I'll Cleveland. be honest, though, on some of the Teddy yeah, exactly. buzz. The thing that bothers me the most is the question of his fire which I've heard from a lot of people. I've heard it on a lot of media outlets, uh, just sort of questioning, like, Teddy's passion for the game, if he's a great leader, if he can live up the locker room. Teddy's personal life, from what I know, is it's very complicated. And he sort of, I mean, his mother has been sick for a while, uh, if I remember correctly. And, you know, that takes a lot out of a person. Like, I empathize with that, because... Teddy probably feels a lot of responsibility on his shoulders. Things that Andrew Luck really doesn't, hasn't really had to face. Um, and I understand, I mean, Luck was pretty much generally known to be a really good prospect for his time. I just don't really see the on-field evidence that as a prospect, Teddy Bridgewater is a tier below Andrew Luck. And I'd love to hear a counter-argument to that, like in terms of what Luck does a lot better than Teddy right now at Louisville. I think the one thing that probably I can argue is Buck called more of his own audibles. Uh, than he had better footwork, too. Mm. Yeah, Honestly, but I think Teddy also moves the pocket better than Luck. And I think Teddy also throws the ball down the field more than Luck did at Stanford. Luck was a game manager at Stanford for the most part. He really didn't do that much. Teddy, I mean, they had that power running game. They had so many other things going for them that Luck is a great passer in his own right, but he was sort of shielded by that system. Here, here's my view on this whole situation. Luck was great because he had, he showed that he had the velocity on his arm. He showed that he had the ability to go deep. <laughs> but, I mean, it, he never really did go deep because he didn't have to. That wasn't part of, that wasn't part of Pep Hamilton's system. You, don't, you didn't have to worry about him throwing deep because he wasn't going to go deep to Chris Owusu or pretty much half of who they had. You know, there wasn't that great prospect, that receiver, for him to throw to. You know, his best receiver was Owusu or it was a tight end like, um, I completely forgot his name. Zach Ertz. I mean, Toy Lolo was there while he was there, right? Toy Lolo, Ertz, you know, 
I'm I'm thinking of the guy that's in Indian with him right now. It's, it's oh, Fleener. Fleener. You had those three guys, and they were all intermediate guys. You never really had a deep threat. You never really needed a deep threat. Yeah, that's true. You know? You know I mean, you, I will say, Teddy, Devontae Parker is a better receiver than anyone that will look at at Stanford, by far. I love Devontae Parker. I think that Devontae Parker, in his own right, could be a first-round pick when it's all said and done. Devontae Parker will come into the NFL and be an average NFL receiver his first year. Just the the same way Keenan Allen was an average NFL receiver his first year. I average think Devontae Parker is better than Keenan Allen was as a prospect, to be honest. And I like Keenan Allen, but as a I prospect. wasn't but quite as high on him as some others were. The thing with Devontae is that he can high point like nobody's business. His hands exactly. are phenomenal. And he He's is so great big and strong, to too. The sidelines. Both guys, though, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, there's no reason to have Bridgewater lower than where you had Luck, outside of his build and his frame and all of that. But the last time he was even measured for us, you know, he had just fought the flu. He was at 185 pounds after just fighting the flu. Dude, I would be 185 pounds after just fighting the flu, you know. Oh, I'm not worried about weight with him. He's six foot three. He's legit six three. He's got the height. Weight you can always add to a guy. You can't yeah. add height. I'm not worried if a guy's a little bit skinny. Whatever. You can always add it. You can always add it. So there's no issue. I, I mean, NFL training program, you know, just to hook him up and he'll be good. Yeah, and I think the thing is that, like, Teddy, I mean, Teddy is taller than Stafford was when he was first overall pick. He's, he's, I think Teddy's going to weigh in around 220, but even so, Sam Bradford was very light when he was the first pick in 2010. And, you know, I just don't get the frame questions. I think it's nitpicking, to be honest, and I think it's trying to sort of create problems where they don't really exist uh, in terms of Teddy Bridgewater. I know that last year... I personally was very high on Geno Smith. I know that others were as well. Um, I think we sort of elevated him a little bit too high because it was a pretty weak top half of the first round class uh, in a lot of different areas, especially a quarterback. And I think people sort of tried to elevate Geno as a consequence of that. But looking at Teddy play, I, I hope to think that I've learned my mistakes from the past. I really just sort of see a star at the next level Worst case, I see someone who can win you playoff games. I see someone who could manage the game for you, take what the defense gives him. Something he did really well this year at Louisville. I don't know how many games you guys watched, but he did a really good job of sort of noting where the defense was and how to best exploit them at Louisville, even if they were giving up the middle of the field, lower part of the field. And I just see a star. I don't buy a lot of the hype that seems to be coming out where Bortles is better. I like Bortles, don't love Bortles. Derek Carr, the hype is coming down on him quite a bit, so that's kind of comforting to see. I, I think I, Teddy Bridgewater is the best quarterback in this class right now, and I think he's going to end up being the first guy picked, uh, whether at one to the Texans or three to the Jaguars. I honestly don't see how he doesn't go at one to the Texans. Because I think the Texans like Bortles quite a bit. People are underestimating the connection there between Bill O'Brien and George O'Leary and who the Texans have brought in for the quarterback coach. Um, Godsey? Yeah, Godsey. Godsey was the quarterback under both O'Brien and O'Leary back when he was at Georgia Tech. He was under them for five years. He basically was an assistant coach when he was there because he was behind Joe Hamilton for four years. Yeah, I was a huge Georgia Tech fan growing up, Zach. So I'm impressed by your Georgia Tech knowledge, man. You probably know more than I do. I was a Florida fan growing up. Both my parents went to UF, so. Well, I mean, the big, I know a bit the about big thing too. for me with Houston at one is that I think that O'Brien is confident that if he finds a quarterback, he can develop a quarterback. And Jadavion Clowney, I mean, let's not forget, this guy's a transcendent talent at defensive end. He might be the best defensive end prospect to come out in the past decade. And if you're going to take him at number one, I have no issue with that whatsoever, even if I love Bridgewater. 
Because yeah. Jadavion Clowney is a monster. He's going to change that defense. Jadavion Clowney, J.J. Watt on the same team, same side of the line. Wouldn't know what to How do. do you block that? You don't. You don't. It's you just put four guys there. Back, kneel, get in the fetal position, and get down <laughs> on the ground because there is nothing you can do. Yeah, so, it's true. I mean, you have the first overall pick in the second round. You're probably not going to get Teddy Bridgewater caliber guy, but you could totally get Derek Carr first pick in the second round, in my opinion. I don't think he's going in the first round. The hype seems to be slowing down on him a bit. You could probably even get a guy like, say, I mean, Logan Thomas gets a lot of flack, but if you fancy yourself a quarterback whisperer, he has the upside to develop into a starter. You could make some sort of chicken salad out of chicken bones if you decide to take a quarterback in the second round, but only if you take Clowney first overall. I don't I don't see it happening. There's a the age old adage in the NFL. If you don't have a quarterback, you get you one. Get a quarterback. If you have the number one overall pick, there's a ninety nine percent chance you don't have a quarterback. If you have a top three pick five years in a row like the Rams did why was that? They didn't have a quarterback. I mean, just look at the Dolphins taking Jake Long and then, what, the Falcons at four took Matt Ryan, and we all know how that went. Yep, Falcons had five years of success. Dolphins had, what, one? Yeah. And that wasn't even really because of their own doing. That was because of, uh, God, Bernard Pollard's doing. But, I mean, I do, I would understand, though, if, I mean, Bill O'Brien, at the end of the day, he's coming in his first year, the Texans have talent, but he might want a couple of years to build his team. And I'm a big proponent of being coached three years, maybe four, if they're extenuating circumstances. So I could see um, Bill O'Brien saying, worst case scenario, they get you Davion Clowney and they have to deal with Matt Schaub and or Case Keenum at quarterback or even a free agent because I could see them maybe trying to bring in a free agent at quarterback. Worst case, what happens? They get another chance next year at getting a quarterback. Like... Yeah, and they but, get one of the best defensive end prospects to come out in the past decade. So yeah, but I don't really see the downside there because I don't think O'Brien's getting fired go, after one year. Worst case, they go 8-8, eight and eight and they have no chance at a legitimate quarterback next year. They've got a great pass rush, but they still can't get above the playoff hump. That's worst case scenario. They're in quarterback. They go 8-8. Eight and eight. I think that they, they're fine at quarterback. It's not their issue. They go 8-8. Eight and eight. I think the bigger problem is that they don't have the – back seven to play against the better teams in the NFL. I think their real issue if they go 8-8 eight eight is that they don't have a quarterback and they'll win in spite of a, ba a bad quarterback. They'll win with a good running game. They'll win with a good defense. They'll look like the, basically what the 2000 Ravens would have looked like if they played today. That 2000 Ravens team would have been garbage today because it was Jamal Lewis – and it was that nasty defense. That was the 2000 Ravens. I mean, that, that's that's what they would have looked like today. They would be 8-8. Eight and eight. They probably would not even come close to the playoffs. I mean, I, I don't see them as a team that can make the playoffs next year unless they fix their quarterback situation. I agree with you, Scott. I mean, and honestly... I don't understand the reason that Derek Carr is falling off in people's minds. And when I look at Derek Carr, I see a guy who has a higher ceiling than any of the other quarterbacks in the class right now. I don't I mean, see Derek Carr people. shouldn't go to Houston to begin with, probably because. Yeah, I'm not saying I he still should go number get one. How they could I'm not saying that. that to their face. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I mean that would Vikings. they would they would go insane. But I mean, I, I feel like the problem with Carr to me is that I have a feeling. I mean, this isn't just because of his brother. I want to preface it with that because it's going to sound like I'm just comparing to his brother. I have a feeling that if he ends up on a team with a bad offensive line, he's going to falter at the next level badly. Granted, that happens to most quarterbacks, but from what I've seen with Carr, he, his mentality changes throughout games if he's pressured, which is a really, really negative aspect, especially for young and experienced quarterbacks. Well, I think that Carr's biggest issue is his footwork. And to me, if you fix his footwork, like you fix most of the issues that he has with pressure. That I mean, I I agree with that, but I also think he can't throw on the run. You're gonna have to. That's a long process to fix his footwork. I mean, 
he has a special arm. I think that we can agree that his arm probably is one of the best in the class, especially amongst the top quarterbacks. But I, I'm i still a little bit iffy that it's all fixable. I mean, he sort of seems like the kind of quarterback who you really want to see star. By the end of the day, you might get lucky, you might win some games and might get the playoffs with him, but he isn't the kind of guy who you can trust week in and week out to sort of be a championship caliber quarterback. Whoa, kind of like a Joe Flacco, Jay Cutler tier player. Hey Ben, where's your video? Uh, I'm I'm eating right now. I don't want to be rude. What are you oh, eating? Sure. I'm eating cereal. My mom's asleep, so I can't make anything that requires loudness. You know, you don't want to anger the Jewish mother. You know. So let's eat yeah, cereal. Choice. What? So let's eat cereal. <laughs> So what are we so talking, we're talking about? about quarterbacks right now? What do you think about this quarterback class? Who's one quarterback that you sort of think is either overrated or underrated by the mainstream? Um, I think that Blake Bortles has been severely overrated because he's big, white, and can run kind of fast. I mean, you know, you look at him, his accuracy is inconsistent. His decision-making is questionable. He can't read a defense. Consi- I mean, you know, he... he 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 can read a basic you know he can read a basic defense but he has issues reading complicated defense, um, but and his footwork's pretty bad too. And frankly, I don't see what he does better than Derek Carr at all. Actually, um, I think he's been severely overrated. He's a top sixty guy for me, and the fact that people are touting him as a possible number one overall pick is ridiculous. It, well, I you know it's funny. I, he reminds me a little bit of Luck just because I think that where they both succeed the most is when they have to run forward and throw while sprinting forward toward the line of scrimmage. They have the same exact throw where they both run forward and then they throw the ball while sprinting across the line of scrimmage. And that's sort of like, that's Blake Bortles. He's sort of like, you see the tools, but... Can't put it all together. His footwork is not good. He doesn't get any power from his lower body when he throws the ball. It is really abysmal to me, sort of watching him use only his arm to sort of direct the ball. I think that he's the kind of player who you have the physical tools, you want to work with him, you want to make him better. I think he's a smart guy from all accounts, but I wouldn't take him number one overall. I wouldn't take him over Teddy. I probably wouldn't take him over Manziel, to be honest, because I actually really like how some of Manziel's skills translate to the next level, I'd have him as my third or fourth quarterback in this class. That's about where I have him. I have him as the third quarterback in the class. The issue that... The real issue that I have with Bortles is that people are forgetting the connection that you see between Bortles and basically Christian Hackenberg. Very similar guys. Very similar quarterbacks. If you look at both Bortles and Hackenberg, I don't see why. That's why I think Bill O'Brien actually takes him that. High. That's the big reason, is you see a lot of similarities in what he likes. He picked Hackenberg out of like four quarterbacks who wanted to go to Penn State. The biggest question for me about Bortles is whether or not he'll be able to speed up his deli- delivery and still be effective. I-, I think Bortles is the kind of guy who definitely, his mechanics get a little bit out of whack, and he has a lot of trouble sort of playing against rushes and keeping his mechanics together, uh, which does scare me at the next level, because I don't think it's the arm of a Matt Stafford or Tony Romo to necessarily be able to compensate for that. Or a Manziel. I think Manziel's a better arm than Bortles. I don't think it's that close to be honest. I think Manziel's a much better arm than Bortles, especially in terms of intermediate velocity. I mean, right now, my top five quarterbacks, I'm going to give my dude some love right now. It is Bridgewater, Manziel, Bortles, Derek Carr, and Keith Lennon. I am fully aboard right now. I had Brett Smith higher than him. I'm moving Wenning up. He killed at the Shrine game. He has everything that anyone would want in a quarterback, especially when you're talking about developmental guys. And I sort of kind of think, I don't really think that there's a legit immediate starter in this draft after Bridgewater and maybe Menzo. 
So if we're talking about developing a guy, I mean, Wenning is the kind of big frame, mobile passer who you want to develop quarterback to be. And, you know, I will, I'll go down with the ship. I'm going to go all in on Wenning because I think that when you look at the way that he plays the game, when you look at the offense he came from, and you look at the way he passed the ball, the intermediate velocity he brings, the touch he brings, it's too par with any quarterback in this class. I think that he's one of the guys who would went to a bigger school who would get more hype, and he's a guy who should be a second day pick at this point to me. I would have a late third to early fourth round grade on. Speaking of guys who probably are going to go in the late, who probably should go in the late third or early fourth, but and are probably in that fifth to thirty range on the quarterbacks. AJ McCarron. I have a feeling he goes top five because Oakland's stupid. <laughs> yeah. I haven't even thought about that, but if that happens, I'm just like, that's it. That's the end of draft Twitter. I'm just saying, every year there is a pick that just seems so ridiculously stupid, and every year it's either the Browns or the Raiders. With them at four and five, we're going to get back to back. Oh, my God, did they really just do that? And half of draft Twitter is going to just go, oh, my God, this is hilarious. And the other half is going to be rolling on the floor, literally laughing. If Manziel and McCarron go four or five, I might die. I mean, I don't know if my – I mean, the amount of trash I've talked – I mean, not <laughs> trash, but the amount of stuff I've said – about both, like, where I... Th I think that Manziel's a second-round pick and a very good second-round pick, uh, but he's not a guy I want starting immediately for my football team. McCarron is a guy I don't want on my football team. Um, I don't think he's ever going to do anything of note in the NFL. I don't think that he's draftable. Um, so if he goes if he, if he goes day one, let alone top five, I might fall off whatever, wherever I'm sitting and probably injure myself. Well, here's, here's the thing about draft rankings. Don't worry about where they get selected. Worry about how good they are. Because where they get selected means nothing. Honestly, where they get selected means nothing. And McCarron might succeed in Oakland. But I remember there was another quarterback who I thought probably shouldn't have gone in the first round who wound up going top five overall named Matt Ryan, and there's a lot of similarities between McCarron and Ryan. Especially uh, Austin. And I don't like McCarron. Don't get me wrong. I don't like McCarron. I think at best he's a backup in the NFL. But I think Oakland could see the same similarities that I do and fall in love with the off the field and raise him very high on their board even though he's not that great on the field. Matt Ryan's arm off of his back foot is ten times better than McCarron's arm when he steps oh. into a pass. Oh, no, I'm not disagreeing with you there. That's what I'm saying. At best, he's a backup. At best, McCarron is a very poor man. Very, very poor man. I'm talking like the brothers at the end of Trading Places or <laughs> version of Matt Ryan. The ironic thing, I think that... Manziel would be a better fit for Oakland, and McCarron would be a better fit for Cleveland. Because the way McCarron sort of won for me at Alabama, he's not a game manager. I think that everyone here understands that. But his arm is slightly better than people think, and his accuracy is slightly worse than people think. People his think that he's only good over the middle of the field. He cannot place the ball at all. I like, don't even think his arm is better than people think. Like, that, watching Oklahoma uh, on that, like... I think it was a slip screen or whatever. Um, when it was a His pick six, was low and it was horrible. It was he so bad. Yards. I've seen him go. 50 I thought yards. the TV was moving in, in the slow National motion. Against Notre Dame, he threw two fifty-yard passes that slipped through Amari Cooper's hands. So I think that he can. It's probably his maximum. He doesn't have a great arm, but he has a slightly better arm than people think he does. But either way, I actually think that he could be reasonable in Cleveland with those weapons. I think Josh Gordon and A.J. McCarron could be a fun combination to watch, it, but he's not going to go there. Here's the thing. Um, if his technique isn't perfect every single time he throws the ball, which it rarely is, Like you're going to get some ugly passes. His decision-making is also atrocious. Yes. And, and you know, talk about how stats don't reflect that at all. His, by his wide receivers, I would say a good 60% of the time. 
that, you know, uh, I watched his LSU game. There was three passes in that. No, there was probably more than that that should have been picked off that were horrible. I'm with you there. I mean, he just he gives you passes that are awful a good bit of the time. Where you just... But the passes that are worse to me are the shorter passes, where he doesn't place the ball well, doesn't let his wide receiver come back to sort of win the ball from the cornerback. Those are the passes to me that are terrible. The deep passes, he might throw a couple of interceptions, but usually they're, well, the idea is sort of like the, the right idea. And I think he has the arm to be reasonable at the next level uh, in terms of getting the ball down the field. I wouldn't take him in the first few rounds. I think that he's a backup, a Ryan Fitzpatrick type. That's always been my comparison on him. But... I also think that there's a difference between being a game manager who's a starter and a game manager who's a backup. And to me, AJ McCarron is a game manager who's a backup, a downfield passer who doesn't understand how to keep the ball safe. I think he'll throw a lot of passes. <coughs> Not dissimilar to Jimmy Clausen in Carolina. Up oh, now Jimmy we got There we go. <laughs> Jimmy Clausen is probably the best comparison and the worst comparison that AJ McCarron could probably have. It's the most accurate I, and it's the, the least... The sad thing is, I still kind of think an uh, unpopular opinion. Actually, I, I'm going to parlay this unpopular opinion into another unpopular opinion. I think Jimmy Clausen, from what I saw in Carolina, he wasn't as bad as people think he was. He had no help there. At all. No help in Carolina. A lot of tipped interceptions, a lot of bad luck. I think that he deserves another chance at some point. He probably won't get it, but he's got a bad rap in Carolina, to be completely honest. I think he's a better starting quarterback than like Matt Castle is. Yeah. I don't think that I don't think he'd do that much worse in Minnesota than like Matt Castle is doing in Minnesota. I mean he won't get the chance, but whatever. I mean that's just sort of how it is. But Matt Castle reminds me of Steve DeBerg. <laughs> well, he's heard of Atlanta. I yeah, do you know what that, that means? Now? Do you know what that means, though? Steve DeBerg started, like, three years in the NFL, looked like crap, but his best role was as a complete backup. An absolute backup his entire career. He was the backup who taught the other guys the playbook. That was his job. A Luke McCown, for a more modern reference. Yeah. A Josh McCown, for a more modern reference. More and more modern. A but David up, Carr. And we're we're about to go on the Falcons right now. I think Mike Smith, I think of the Falcons that Jim Schwartz their head coach, I don't think that they have as high a pick as they do. I think Jim Schwartz should be the Falcons' next head coach after Mike Smith gets I back. think if the Falcons had Jim Schwartz as their head coach, they would have never made the playoffs all five years that they did. I disagree. I think that Jim Schwartz is the kind of coach who needs a strong locker room to help him sustain that atmosphere and to help him bring the intensity that he's supposed to bring. And we've seen a lot of defensive coaches who have trouble their first time around because they get <coughs> caught up in the camaraderie. And the great thing about the Falcons is that you guys have a very balanced locker room with a lot of really good linebackers, defensive linemen who are relatively reasonable and who sort of can help the coach get the locker room Thomas Dimitrov is a supportive guy. I really don't think Martin May, he was a great GM, to be completely honest. That's my opinion. Uh, but I think Jim Schwartz would be a better coach right now for the Falcons than Mike Smith. How do you feel about the Pioli hiring? I mean, I Pioli like, is I like a, the Pioli hiring because it's somebody who says, hey, here's how to scout a lineman. Here's how to scout a defensive lineman. Here's how to scout an offensive lineman. Because the only position out of any lineman that Thomas Dimitrov has actually hit on has been defensive tackle, where he's hit on Corey Peters and kind of hit on – actually, he hit on Peters and Walker, and then he kind of not really hit on Jerry. Jerry was with the team for He didn't hit on Jerry. He missed on Jerry. Jerry was a bust. Yeah, Jerry Let's not miss words. Jerry sucks. Jerry was an injury bust, though. Can you really hold that against him? Can you hold that against the GM, is my question. Yes. I was a bad pick at the time. He wasn't as good as other guys on the board. I don't know. I'm with you there. I wanted him to take William Moore in the first round. 
We all know I mean, the thing with Pioli is I think that his talent evaluation was never really in question. Um, his issue is that he's a paranoid guy who cannot be the only person in charge of something. Exactly. He just does not have the managerial skills to run an organization. Talent evaluator, he's great, but he can't be the boss. Well, guess what? He's not the boss. Exactly. Exactly, which is, I, I agree with you. I think it is a good fit. I'm looking forward to seeing the work he does with the organization. Atlanta can only go up from where they're at right now, and it's not like they're at a horrible starting point. They've got their quarterback. You know, they need a left tackle. They need a defensive end. But they've got some solid linebackers. They've got a good safety. They've got a mediocre safety. They've got solid corners, at least potential. Trufant looked good, though, this year. Don't get me wrong. Um, although Zach is sitting there like, y'all should have just re-signed Grimes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm glad that you didn't. I yeah. do like Trufant, though. I think that he'll be very good for you guys down the road. He'll be a guy who, by the time his rookie contract is out, you'll be more than happy to spend whatever it takes to keep him on your team. If only he could learn how to catch. If yeah. he could learn how to catch, he would have had seven interceptions. He had five just go right through his hand. He was like, ah, and then knocked it down. I mean, you can practice those skills. But the thing I with Trufant, that my biggest issue with him coming out, because as, you, as Scott knows, I was a little bit lower on Trufant than a lot of other people, was that he, the game didn't come that naturally to him when I watched him play. Uh, in terms of, like, he sort of, like, you could see the wheels turning when he was in coverage, when he had to make a play on the ball. I think that it slowed down a bit firm in terms of having to mirror, having to cover, but the ball skills will come. I actually think that, you know, I can understand when I was incorrect about sort of seeing how a guy would adapt. I think Trufant, he exceeded my expectations, and I'm excited to see how he adapts, but I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a lot more interceptions in the next few years. Well, Nolan's scheme is perfect for him, too, because it mixes up coverages every single play. One play he's in off man, one play he's in press, one play he's in a matchup zone, the next play he's in cover three. You know, it just it changes every play. So with a guy like Trufant, he's like, oh, well, I get to do this now? Oh, I get to do that now? Some guys get bored in a scheme where all they're doing is playing off man every play like he did at Washington. You know, yeah. it gets aggravating. All right, so moving on from the Falcons, because while Scott loves the Falcons... We, there are lots of other teams, 31, in fact, that we can talk about. Um, let's talk about more general draft stuff. So I've been on a cornerback sort of role recently in terms of finding some interesting sleeper-type cornerbacks to take a look at. Uh, who is one player, I guess cornerback or safety, secondary player, who you think is sort of flying under the radar right now? Um, There's two guys. One of them is Pierre Desir who I have a first-round grade on, but I think he is flying under the radar. The other is Kyle Fuller, who I see as a bigger, no issue off the field, not you. Ben, you can talk. I, I, didn't, I, I did not want to interrupt you. Uh, I, yeah, I've, I've been saying for, I mean, not that it matters, I, I've been saying for like a month that I think Pierre Desir is a first-rounder, and thank God that he, he got the Senior Bowl invite because... He's able to show himself uh, against like the top tier talent. He really performed well, and athletically, he's all there. Um, yeah, he's a little bit raw, but you watch his tape, and he just complete. I mean, no one threw at him. He he completely shut down the receiver. Um, and yeah, that was a lot of it was just using his raw athletic ability. But you know, he gets to the he gets to the Senior Bowl, and he starts showing you know good technique. He plays the ball well. Um, he's a long athlete. He can press at the. I'm he's. A, very, very good corner, uh, and I think that, you know, I don't think he's going to go in the first round. I think he should, but, you know, team's going to draft him in the second round. They're going to get a very good player, and, you know, some team might draft Justin Gilbert top ten and be very upset with themselves for the next five years. Um, another secondary player I think is kind of flying under the radar is Jimmy Ward, uh, probably the best center fielder in the class. Well, yeah, I think that he's the best center for the great range, great recognition. He's a very good athlete, plays the ball well. He needs to work on coming up in the run. Uh, he did improve from last year to this year, which is always a good thing to look at. Uh, but as a pure cover safety, he's incredibly talented. And if I were to give a first-round grade to a safety besides a ha-ha Clinton Dix, it would probably be Jimmy Ward. 
I love that. Jimmy Ward is my guy. I've been out, I, I have been a fan of Jimmy Ward since last year, and it's been it's been actually a lot of fun to see a lot of people sort of jump on the Jimmy Ward bandwagon. Yeah, I mean he's he's really. I I, I remember watching him in preseason, and you know the athletic ability was definitely there, uh, but he didn't he didn't do. I mean he, there was still a lot that I wanted to see, and he he really kind of put it together this year. Uh, he still needs to work as a run defender, but you know you just you just let him you know put him put him center field and let him ball hawk and he's he's gonna he's gonna make returns. I mean, it reminds me. Of, I think that about? he does what Mark Barron tries to do better than Mark Barron. And I, I've said before that I honestly think if Jimmy Ward went to Alabama instead of Northern Illinois, even though he tried to pretend that college doesn't matter where a guy gets drafted. I think Jimmy Ward would be in talks to be a top 15 pick. Switch where Ha Ha Clinton Dix went to school and Jimmy Ward went to school, and I think that Jimmy Ward's the one who is the consensus number one safety in this class. Straight up. I, I don't know. I still like Craig Lawson. Nevin Lawson? Craig Lawson. I like Craig Lawson, too. I know you like him more than Eric Reed last year. Well, to be fair, I, I didn't really like Eric Reed last year. When I compare a guy to Roman Harper, that's not exactly. Um, that's not exactly a nice thing. How uh, do you I guys? Robin Harper is a very good safety in any way, shape, or form. So, how do you guys feel about my boy Jamea Thomas? I think that I think I didn't like the fact that they moved him to corner. I didn't think you. I think his natural fits at safety. Um, See, I like him better as a nickel corner, as like a that nickel again. Another one of those guys that you use like Tyran Matthew. Yeah. I can see that. I, I just, he's not just not a conventional outside corner, but I, you could definitely talk me into that. I mean, you, I think a roamer role would definitely be perfect for him. I agree. To me, as long as you keep him in the middle of the field, like he's gonna eat. Yeah. Like he just he's got he's got the arms of like a six foot five guy. I mean, like his instincts are just insane. I was watching the FSU ta tape from last year. Just like he was playing like fifteen yards off the line of scrimmage and just like this one play, and he just flew up to the line of scrimmage, made a tackle on a running play, like two-yard gain, just, it's insane. He's all over the place. All right, so I, 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 I got to preach about one cornerback of this class. I've been talking about him a lot on Twitter recently. Um, I really just don't think he's getting that much attention. Dexter McDougal from Maryland. Um, this is a guy who literally got injured the third game of this year. When in the game, by the way, he had two interceptions, one for a touchdown, and two other PBs. This is a guy who is a big cornerback. He's physical. He has really, really fluid hips. Great ball skills. He actually, I, I did the draft decks thing a couple of months ago where I sort of like said this player as a prospect can evolve into a certain player who evolve to an even better one. Dexter McDougal, his ball skills remind me of Charles Tillman in Chicago. I think he can play in multiple different schemes. I really like his physicality. I think he's a strong cornerback. I think he's fast enough to guard against the number one and number two perimeter receivers in the NFL. And, you know, we had a torn ACL. I think it's affected him. It's going to affect him going forward. But I also think that he has the potential to be someone very special at the next level. I hope he ends up with the right team. I think the Patriots could take a long look at him. They love Edsel. They love... Maryland guys, uh, I think Dexter McDougal is someone who everyone, if you haven't gotten a chance to watch him yet, you should definitely watch some tape on him. Uh, other than the guys who I've been touting generally, I mean, Eric Pinkins from San Diego State, the safety cornerback hybrid, is someone who I really like. 6'3", 215, tons of upside, switched positions as a senior because they needed him at safety, did what the team wants him to do. I think he could be a really good pro prospect. E.J. Gaines, I still have a first-round grade on. I really like his upside. But McDougal is the guy who right now I would say, if you haven't watched him before, get to know him because he has some special skills. I've watched him, like, I mean, just, you know, watching ACC football. But I'm yet to really watch him, if that makes sense. Just, like, review his film. He also has not gotten to play with a real safety in his career. I mean, Kenny Tate was a safety of his. Kenny Tate. Kenny Tate was off. I'll drink That's for it. that. 
But um, yeah, no, I, I think like I those linebackers though. Class, I've said before, I think that there's a top tier. Um, I have EJ Gaines in that tier, but I think that the general consensus top three are Bradley Roby. Um, oh God, I'm totally blinking. Kyle Fuller. And, uh, Kyle Fuller just not as that top tier. I don't think he's. I, have, I think Kyle Fuller go as high as thirteen to Pittsburgh. I think Kyle Fuller would be a great fit in Pittsburgh at thirteen. I, I mean I don't want them to see a corner because that means that my boy is going to be out of there. But Cortez. Yeah, but I don't know about that. I think they also need to replace Ike, and Ike is getting older. I mean I I've said before I think, I, I think that Dark Darquez is the other one Darquez Denard. Ike Taylor and Arquise and Art, I think, are pretty good comparisons of one another. I kind of like that a lot, the more that I think about it. Um, but I think Ike Taylor is getting up there in years. Didn't have a great year. I could see Kyle Fuller taking his place in a year or so. His quarterbacks tend to take a year to bake anyway. So um, Cortez Allen, I think, would be good to stay if he ended up picking Kyle Fuller. I don't think I Cortez think stays there after team. this year, if you want honesty. I think he's ready to move back down south. Cortez? Yeah. I don't think he wants to stay in Pittsburgh after this season. Um, you, you forgot Jason Verrett. I'm not a – I mean, I've talked about Jason Verrett before. Everyone in the preseason had, like, a top 5 to 10 grade on him. And I think that sort of turned me off a little bit too much because I watched him play and I was like, I don't see the hype. I don't get why people are saying top 5 to 10. Um, slot quarterback, great. He reads the eyes of quarterbacks better than almost any cornerback in this class. I really like sort of his projection in the slot, maybe with some smaller receivers. Maybe his absolute peak to me would be if he was used like Joe Hayden is in Cleveland where he can read the eyes of cornerbacks, you shade blitzes so you force the quarterbacks to run to his side, throw into coverage, and you can sort of like pick off cornerbacks from there, or quarterbacks from there. Uh, I'm just not sold on how scheme versatile he is, and I'm not sure he can guard against the really physical, big perimeter receivers in the NFL. Uh, I also think that better quarterbacks can trick him with their eyes. Because he reads quarterbacks' eyes way too much. It's good to a certain point, but I also think that he can be a little bit too reliant on sort of going with his gut rather than what the quarterback is going to end up doing. And the quarterback can trick him. I've seen it a couple of times against worse quarterbacks than we'll see in the NFL. Guys like Justin Maxwell at Michigan State. So I really think that Verrett is good. I have probably a mid-second round grade on him at this point maybe a little bit later. I'm not sure I could put him as a number five quarterback in the class. I've had a lot of struggles with that about who to put there. But I think he'll be a good pro in some capacity. I'm just not sure he can be a starter on the perimeter that would warrant a first-round pick. I don't know. I mean, people people get really worried about – I mean, the reading the eyes thing I think is a legitimate concern. But at the same point, it's also a plus that he has because – you know, I, I think he does it so well, but at the same, what, what you brought up does make sense. But uh, the the whole physical thing, I, I don't really get because you know you got guys like um, Brandon Flowers and Tim Jennings who are very, very, very good cornerbacks who are probably about the same size, uh, and they play perimeter as well. And it's just a matter of being physical. And Jason Brett's incredibly physical. He uses his hands very well. Uh, can really get his hands inside. At the line, he's his footwork's great. Uh, you know, he's a great man, uh, man corner, but he's even better in zone. Uh, people don't talk about his short area quickness. Uh, he's not a long like his long speed isn't going to be great in the NFL, but uh, just allowing him to flow in and out of zone and kind of make plays on the ball. He, he play and I think he plays the ball very well. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that he just needs to end up in the right situation. But he can be a very good corner. And also, uh, this isn't a huge. I mean, this isn't a huge thing, but it's definitely a plus. I don't think any corner attacks the run the, like he does, and uh, that's always great to get a guy who likes to get his nose in there and make a hit. I agree. He's very physical, and what impresses me the most about him is the way that he just drives on the ball. Like, I mean, sometimes yes, it costs him, but it's another reason that he's able to make a lot of the plays that he makes. Yeah, agreed. I, I, know, I know that on my Twitter, Sean Moosh is talking about Ross Cockrell, who I like as a cover corner, but he cannot play the run. 
from what I've seen. He's, he's about as run averse as Roberson is for Florida. That's true. Um, but no, um, the funny thing is that my comparison for Barrett has always been Nathan Basher, the former Bears slot corner, who had a really good career for a while, sort of being that pickoff big play cornerback. And, I mean, Brandon Flowers wasn't good this year. Let's not beat around the bush. He was not a good year overall. Um, a lot of members from that defense were overrated to begin with. But, That's I mean, true. I could see for it, maybe, if you play him in the right sort of scheme, getting some off, getting inside release on a lot of these wide receivers and making plays. I'm just still not sold enough to give him a first-round pick. Although, we'll see what team he ends up on. I like him. I think he has a lot of directable skills. I'm just not sure that he is as diverse as some of the other guys in this class. I've got a late one, early second on him right now. Cornerbacks bore me this year. There's one guy who like stands out, and there's a bunch of future depth guys. That's what uh, I see. Yeah, I don't agree with that at all. I think that I see uh, one starter in Pierre Desir. The rest of them I see as depth guys, all of them. Yeah, I'm gonna be completely I'm not wrong. a fan of this class. I have yet to watch a full game of Pierre Desir's because all the tape I've seen is grainy and not very good. So, well, I, I haven't really, like, on the top not getting thrown at. Hmm? I mean, I don't buy those stats completely because I think that it's hard to keep them, and I don't necessarily completely trust the sources they're coming from. Um, but I, I do think, I mean, I think this year has a lot of upside. I just haven't, I've watched, like, a few minor tapes. I just haven't watched a full game of his yet because I haven't been able to get my hands on it. I just haven't really seen the insane qualities that people seem to be hyping up about him. I think he's a big cornerback. He has some good hips. I think he's athletic. But, I mean, I, I just don't necessarily see what makes him so much better than a Dexter McDougal. Well, he was only thrown at four times in the senior bowl. Yeah. But he's All those four him throws, him there was a pass deflection, an overthrow on a guy who he was wide, definitely covered. It was that one time he got beat on a magical throw. It took a ridiculous throw to beat him. And then he had that interception, interception on, the that, on the play that he didn't get fooled from the trick. In the which a lot of guys get fooled from that. He didn't get fooled on the trick play. He stuck with his man, and he caught the ball. We're talking about the senior bowl, right? The senior bowl, yes. The, the senior, senior bowl, I think, also gets overvalued in terms of evaluating players. Because yeah, I mean... First schemes... They, like, haven't done anything. It's basically a glorified pickup game. I mean, it's nice to see sort of, like, how... I mean, to see her, he's athletic enough. But did anyone really doubt if he was athletic enough? I, I didn't. I think that my biggest issue is once he gets to the next level, has to play more complex playbooks, has to face against better receivers, how he's going to deal. The and I'm still not so... that much more complex for a cornerback. Exactly. That's, what, that's why cornerback is so easy to adjust from. You know, you've got off-man, you've got... Inside, you've got inside alignment, outside alignment. You've got matchup zone, and you've got press man. That's and it. Press bail. Yeah, and press bail. I mean, like that's that's it. Like you don't really have any ridiculous assignments as a cornerback. But the, you know, maybe there's the cover three. Maybe there's so this. Much you're not doing anything really different. A I mean, playing against cornerback, is cornerback. Not the same as playing against. Random five foot nine guy at Lindenwood. It's a difference. Yeah, which to me is why the tape from the Senior Bowl is that much more important. Like we don't have that much good footage on him right now. So to you know go and watch him ball out against some of the best prospects you know in the nation was impressive. But well, I don't understand why someone like Dexter McDougal is a guy who is not quite as big as him, but plays very physically. Has played against better competition has great measurables, have made, makes tons of plays on the ball. I so just don't it, get why, invited. if he wasn't injured, he wouldn't go higher than this year. I, I, mean, I think McDougal, had he not been injured, would probably have been invited to the Senior Bowl, and you would have seen why he's not as good. Now, I like McDougal as well. I think he's a very good corner. I don't think that he's going to be this knockout starter, and I didn't really see anything at Maryland that I couldn't see from this year, even though he was going against the Lindenwoods competition. 
I didn't really see anything at Maryland that he went up that McDougal went up against that was that different than what you know the Sear saw at Maryland or at Lindenwood. You know, Maryland ACC receivers who were five foot nine to six foot on average. He was going against mainly triple option teams at Lindenwood. Well, I uh, guess what you got Georgia Tech and you got you know Stanford who doesn't really pass the ball that well, and Boston College who doesn't really pass the ball that well. With their one option in Alex Amadon, who's like five foot five. There's a difference. I mean, I mean, there's not much difference if you're talking about no. five foot five corners. There's a big five difference. Five receivers. I mean, you played, We're against talking Watkins, the same you played against some of the best receivers in the country, and even so, he made plays in the ball every game. He would always get his hands in the ball. And we'll see about this year. I like him as a prospect. I'm just not sure why you have him as a first round pick. To be honest, like I just don't necessarily get that kind of hype. It wasn't just the Senior Bowl. It was the Senior Bowl. It was the Shrine Game. He's been showing out every every chance he gets. He shows out. He's going to show out at the combine, which is only going to help. I mean, I guess we'll see. I'm I'm interested to see which team picks him because I think that uh, he definitely has upside. Um, I'm just not sure I'd spend a first round pick on it like both of you purport to. One. I've got a second on him. I've got a second on him right now. I don't have a grade really on him because I don't feel comfortable grading without having. Like, yeah, I mean, a it's just background on the guy. I mean, that's fair. I, guess I I would have a day two grade on him just because, like hypothetically, it sounds like a that's consensus and b in terms of his measurables and the statistics and the slight tape I've seen. That's probably where I'd put him. But like, I don't really like. Even that's very tentative because I haven't seen enough of him to really make a judgment. He has so all we, of the tools of a first round pick. Well, we've gone on about secondary plays for a while, so I'll let you guys pick the next position and move on from there. Ben, let's let's go with you since you've been somewhat quiet. I get to pick the next position. I don't know. I like talking cornerbacks. I don't think I don't think we we covered enough. Uh, I mean, we didn't even talk about Stanley John uh, Baptiste, and we didn't really get to touch on Bradley Roby that much. Uh, and I both, I think both of them are first rounders. Uh, I think people to put too much stock in the fact that Bradley Roby was kind of miscast in, in the in the defense that Ohio State ran this year. Uh, I mean, he's a man corner, and when he was put in man, they and play we saw, cover three. What? And they like would put him in cover three. Yeah, and it was it was three. stupid, and we saw what happened to him. And, you know, you look at the 2012 tape when he was able to play in man, and he looked like a top 10 pick. He was phenomenal, uh, and he's also incredibly physical. He plays the run really well, um, and people just kind of forget about that because he, he did poorly in, <laughs> in a scheme that was not – that's not and, – and, yeah, everything's kind of about, you know, fitting a, fitting a scheme. And, frankly, I now know that I'm drafting a guy who's incredibly gifted uh, physically – can play man coverage really well, and now has experience in zone. So I'm, you just have to use them correctly. It's just a matter of just being smart with your players and putting them in the best position to succeed in, in that regard. Um, I agree. Yeah, and quickly touching on Baptiste, uh, he's another very talented in terms of his uh, physical ability, former wide receiver, and he plays cornerback like a wide receiver. I mean, he runs routes better than the wide receivers he's covering, and that's ridiculous. I, he's incredibly fluid, and he plays plays the ball really well. He's really good hands. Um, at the line, his his jam at the line is is nasty. I would not want to get caught, uh, you know, in a in a press situation because he he could absolutely take a player away at, uh, if he gets his hands on them, uh, and that's that's huge. Uh, I mean. I, I don't. He has an issue where he, his recovery speed isn't really good, but I think as, once he starts learning how to use his length consistently in coverage, I, I, I don't really see that being a huge issue. And yeah, obviously you want to say, oh, here's a here's a long corner who played wide receiver. He's Richard Sherman. I mean, that's a little bit lazy, but when you look at their tools, they're not they're not. Unlike, uh, and and I would have no problem spending a late first round pick on a player like Baptiste, who could impact immediately if you put him in the right uh, situation, but could also has plenty of room to grow. Okay, and I'm done talking about corners. <laughs> so if you guys want to move on, no, I, I mean I'm cool talking about corners. I like. I mean I think that after the top four, 
there's a lot of like conversation we have. There's a lot of technical guys, even though Scott apparently doesn't like the corner class. Um, but in terms of like, I don't agree with the Baptiste Sherman comparisons. I think Richard Sherman. People underrate how smart he is on the field. I mean, I was watching videos of Richard Sherman talking about how he consciously tries to tip balls to his teammates for them to make interceptions, which, for the record, more cornerbacks should consciously do more often. Uh, that that impressed me, and we could go on to Richard Sherman talk all night because I, I support what he did against the Niners as well with Aaron Andrews. Um, but... The guy who B Baptiste reminds me of, I think his ceiling to me is a keep to lead. Um, as someone who, and I feel like sometimes cornerbacks, safeties, we don't need to limit guys to positions because to me the way that Baptiste could be best utilized is sort of as a press cornerback on these joker type tight ends. Someone who can get into Jimmy Graham's face, get into Jordan Reed's face, get into Zach Ertz's face, and say, you're not getting past me, and I'm going to shut you down, and he will shut me down. Sort of as a linebacker safety cornerback hybrid in a 3-2, well, 4-2-5 defense, um, which I think more teams are going to be running over the next few years. Uh, I would I would completely agree. And once again, uh, that's a player I would take in the first round, too. I'm, <laughs> especially I think for that's fair. I mean, I, I don't have a first-round grade on John Baptiste. Uh... I think I don't. I haven't really put a round grade on John Baptiste. I, he's probably in like my top ten to twelve corner safety secondary players. Um, if I had to think about it, I haven't really numbered them because I think rankings are a little bit arbitrary at times. But definitely, he is someone who I would uh, invest in at some point in the draft and try to develop. If you feel like you need someone to stop a tight end, he has that kind of. I don't him at all. <laughs> uh, I have a seventh round grade on him. I see a project. Like I, I just I don't. He's got physical tools. Great. I just I don't see. Then again, I had the same issue with Richard Sherman. Very raw. You know, he's probably in. You know, he's probably very intelligent, but he's the same guy he was as a sophomore. He hasn't improved. He hasn't made any strides as a corner. You know, he still looks like he's still a good way away from the position. Yeah. Richard Sherman turned out poorly, too, so... My biggest issue with SJB is... We all miss. <laughs> we all miss. And speaking of that linebacker, cornerback safety role, let's just call it what it is. It is the spur. I feel like so many teams are using it. Look at South Carolina's defense. They call it a spur. It is a linebacker slash corner slash safety. It's, you know, Devontae Holloman in college. It's DJ Swearinger. It's Dante Robinson. They've been using it for years. Um, I think this year the best guy for that role would be Deion Bailey, though, from Southern Cal. Deion Bailey is someone who I think is underrated. You, you pronounced Telvin Smith wrong. <laughs> I like, well, Telvin Smith, he's right there too. Um, don't get me wrong. I just I like Deion Bailey for the role better because he's faster. He's got more range. He can play corner. Is Telvin Smith is used to Arthur Brown. I I don't know. I think I think Telvin Smith looks a lot faster than Bailey on tape, and I think Tel Telvin Smith could be a hell of a linebacker. Uh, I mean, th that's what he wants to play in the NFL, obviously. And I think if he put on you know fifteen twenty pounds, he could be a really really good outside linebacker and. Three. 15 to 20. Oh, even if he puts on 10 pounds. Even if he puts on 10. Four three linebackers that you're seeing. Atlanta's, Atlanta's got three linebackers that are 230. Yeah, I mean, CJ Mosley's 230. How much does he weigh? He weighs, he weighs two, he's 218. 218. He weighs, uh, 218. Five to 10 pounds. He puts on 10, 12 pounds. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, I mean, I that's don't nothing. I, I, think, I think he could. He could play that Cam Chancellor role in the NFL perfectly, but uh, I, I'm, I, I don't know. I think I'd take him, I mean, if he wanted to move to safety, which I, I've gotten yelled at before for saying, I would take him over Deion Bailey and uh, Deion Buchanan, who both of, who, both of whom are, I really like, um, but I think they're very, uh, I think they kind of pigeonhole themselves into a 
a box safety. Uh, as much as I hate to say it, I think that Parsons got it right on the Draft Mecca podcast last night. Like, I mean, like... Why just, you hate to say that? Parsons knows his shit. Nah, I mean, I just like to give Parsons shit. What, 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 did, what did he say? I wasn't watching. Um, I mean, he basically just said that, like, add 10 pounds and, you know, like, he's right at linebacker. He plays it very well. I mean, his instincts are phenomenal. His coverage skills are superb. Like, people who want to, like, risk moving him to strong safety, like, I just don't see that as a, like, good risk to take on a player that you're going to have to probably take in the second round. He's Thomas Can we talk D. about more North Dakota State prospects on this show? What? Can we talk about more North Dakota State prospects on this show? I disagree. <laughs> I think we need to talk about a Texas Tech prospect since we're on the... Uh, the six foot three, two hundred and twenty pound linebacker slash safety guys, Terrence Bullet. I don't know if any of y'all have watched that him. Melvin Bullet's brother. I believe so. He moved from safety to linebacker this year, and his only real job was to cover tight ends. It was hey you go cover the tight end. So he has like eight tackles on the year, but he's got like twelve knockaways. So every single game that I've watched of him, I've been like, this guy is the Jimmy Graham stopper. This is the guy that you draft to just shadow these big, massive tight ends every play. Because he gets right up in the grill, and then he just follows, and he's got great speed. He's probably a 4-6 guy. 4-5, four, 4-6 four, four, guy. last year for the Falcons. What? A little like Bartu. No, Bartu's like a four nine guy who. I thought Bartu was kind of stopped for you guys last year. I like no Bartu didn't stop Graham. Bartu helped slow down Graham. He was a speed bump. Him and uh. Warlow. No, Warlow. Warlow's the mic. Warlow is not going to cover a tight end. Warlow's probably going to cover a fullback or a running wait, back. Wait, I heard about wait, wait. I heard all last year how good Bartu was at stopping tight ends. Bartu was solid, but he wasn't like he wasn't a Jimmy Graham guy. He wasn't the guy who stopped Jimmy Graham. They triple team Jimmy Graham. That's how they tried to stop him, and they still didn't do it. But Atlanta did improve, oh, quite a bit. But no, that's what I'm saying. Ter- Terrence Bullet is the guy that you draft. He's a safety that's playing linebacker who has the speed. And yes, I'm sorry, Ben. We have deteriorated into Falcons talk. I mean, yeah. well, Scott, is he someone who you think that the Falcons could take this year? In the mid-rounds, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's interesting, though, because, I mean, I know that there are guys who probably aren't on the mainstream radar, who haven't played a lot, who these teams could be looking at. So I, I, think, that, I think that's an interesting nugget. Another one and, is Tyler Starr. Oh, we lost Zach. It happens. Okay. Another one is Tyler Starr. Um, South Dakota, yes. big guy. I like Tyler Starr. You know, 6'5", 250, nasty dude, can pass rush. I honestly think he's a better fit for a scheme like the Eagles or the Ravens or the Jets. I think yeah. Bill Belichick is going three. to fall in love with Tyler Starr. I'd, I'd agree with that. He fits everything that Bill Belichick could ever want in a linebacker. Ever. And the more that I watch Tyler Starr, and I watched him against Kansas, I watched him against a whole bunch of other foes, he is so athletic. It is, it's amazing. He is one of the most fluid athletes in that position. I have him as one of my top five outside linebackers now. He is an amazingly fluid athlete. <laughs> Zach's computer erupted into flames. He'll be right back. <laughs> well... He can excuse. cover, he can stop the run, he can rush the passer, he can drop into the flat, he can play man. He can literally do anything that you want a football player to do. He's kind of like Telvin Smith plus 20 pounds, or plus like 30 pounds. But plus so like 30 you, pounds and 3 inches. But yeah. you guys already have Jamie Collins. Why do you need another Jamie Collins? Because Jamie, Jamie Collins is going to play middle, three it looks like. And Jamie Collins is going to end up sticking in that Brian Urlacher type deep cover role where he also blitzes up the middle on occasion. Wait, 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 wait. They're playing Collins in the middle? Yep. Only fucking Belichick, man. And, you know, <laughs> but, but 
tell me, Jamie Collins in the middle, still pretty scary. I mean, he's probably what not going to What about Mayo? Mayo is a, a will. Why not have Collins at the will and Mayo at the mic? Wouldn't that make more sense? I mean, Mayo, maybe. Mayo's I feel the like that the thing with the Patriots, though, is that they like to disguise their looks, so they like to mix up their linebackers a lot. So I bet that you'll see plenty of Collins at the will, Mayo at the mic, Hightower at the mic a lot, because Hightower's slower, so he can't cover as well. They like mixing up their looks. And that's also why I think they're going to take Troy Nicholas this year when they get a chance, because they like mixing up their looks on offense and on defense where the defense or the offense doesn't really know what's happening to them, and they have trouble reacting. They like playing those mind games. And that's something that I also think is a little bit underrated uh, when you're looking at sort of which guys end up fitting on a given team. Coaches keep that in mind, how to deceive defenses and keep them from understanding and keying in on certain factors with the opponent's personnel, and smaller tight ends help tip off pass. Uh, playing with bigger tight ends who can't really catch the ball helps tip off run. These are all things that sort of come into play and should be considered when trying to evaluate offenses for a team. That was why, I mean, Ben's an Eagles fan. I thought the Eagles running there, like, three or four tight end looks were really cool because there are a lot of different things you could do there if you have four tight ends in the court. You can do anything. You could have them all block. You could have three of them block and one of them split out. You could have any permutation of things happen. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's probably why Zach Ertz was drafted so high so we could use those looks, and that's why I think that Chip might take a late-round flyer on uh, Mr. Colt Lyerla in this draft, if not make him a priority free agent. Uh, yeah, I know. You, you, I'm, you're, I'm as nervous as you are, but uh, I think I think that's a risk. That I think that Chip, the relationship that Chip and Colt had will probably be beneficial uh, to kind of use because when he left, it was kind of detrimental, I guess you would say, to uh, Colt's personality, and obviously we know that turned into. Uh, but I would definitely take a late-round flyer on him because of how physically gifted he is and what he could do in the Philadelphia offense. Uh, and we do, I mean, Selleck, Selleck's kind of getting up there, and he's not that great a player. And if we could have a core of, um, you know, Selleck, Casey, Ertz, and Lyra, that would be that'd be quite the group. I mean, I think that the, there's a tight end in this there class who is really being underrated by a lot of people, and that's Richard Rodgers from town. This is a guy who, I don't know how many Cal games you guys watched this year. I happen to watch a lot because when I was living in San Diego, uh, my roommate Grant Gurton, really good friend of mine, roommate of mine at Brown, loved fantasy college football. We played weekly fantasy college football on FanDuel or, no, we played on DraftKings mostly. But pretty much um, he would always pick Cal players because their offense was so crazy. So I saw a lot of Richard Rodgers this year, and then I got to watch more of him uh, after the year ended. He's the closest thing to Aaron Hernandez in this class. The guy is awesome after the catch. He can get down the field vertically. He can block a little bit. He's a big receiver. And all of the skills are there to be molded into something special. I have Rodgers rated as my 5 10 in this class. I really, really like him as a prospect. I have him over Gator. Yes, Scott. Gator Hoskins is a nice, he put up a lot of yards at Marshall. I like him as a prospect. He is not elusive. He goes down to first contact all the time when I watch him. And I think that people who didn't watch the Patriots tend to think, oh, he's a small player. That means that he's like Aaron Hernandez. Aaron Hernandez was insanely elusive after the catch. People could not bring him down right away whenever he got the ball in his hands. He would always make the first defender miss. He would always get downfield. Gator Hoskins can't make guys miss. I like him as a prospect, but I wouldn't take him until the fourth or fifth round. I think Richard Rodgers has the potential to be a sort of receiver to end hybrid like Hernandez was and to be someone special at the next level more than Gator Hoskins. I don't know about that. Although, if looking at a second tight end, I like Arthur Lynch. I like Jake Murphy from Utah. I like Murphy. I like good old Crockett. Um, 
from Cal- uh, I like Oklahoma him. State. Oh, Crockett Gilmore. Yeah, he's Crockett. Good. Why can you not like Crockett? He's six foot six. All first team name. Too. I mean, Arthur Lynch. I think I think Arthur Lynch is very ordinary to me. I can't decide whether I like Arthur Lynch or Marcel Jensen more. Oh, and oh, and Jensen. I think both of them are criminally underused in the in their offenses. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, Lynch is a very underrated receiver because he really didn't get an opportunity to do it. He a catches lot. everything that gets. Yeah, he, he yeah he, he and his work in the intermediate game was ridiculous. I mean, he, it was just it was free yardage basically. Uh, if he was worked into the game plan a little bit more, and he's one of the blockers in this class that just wants. to – you in the mouth, and I love that. I, I mean, I love that mentality. And you know, a lot of people, a lot of people, kind of underrate him for being, I, I, like you said, uh, I don't actually, I don't, would you say ordinary? Uh, you know, you say ordinary, I say Jason Witten. Um, you know, he just kind of has that that mentality when it comes to, you know, he's gonna he's gonna do that dirty work where he's gonna catch those intermediate passes. Yeah, he's not gonna get that deep touchdown that Eric Ebron uh, would do, or he's not gonna make the you know, the crazy catch that Jason Morrow is going to do, but he's going to, you know, help you chip your way downfield and probably get, you know, six or seven catches a game and block for you, which is, I mean, depending on the offense, that's exactly what you want from a tight end. But, I mean, my comparison for Lynch is Chris Kuhn. kind of reminds me. He's like an ordinary guy. I mean, like, it's probably a ceiling where he'll – be an H-back or be a tight end who'll get you a few catches a game. He's not going to ever like set the world on fire, but he can be a top half of the league tight end maybe in the right offense. So that's sort of where he sits. I just see some other guys in this class who, if they get it together, get in the right systems, they could be top ten tight ends in the league in offense. And this is just a very good tight end class with all the underclassmen too, I think. So Yeah, I mean, it's honestly stacked. Yeah, I, I mean, mean... Y'all know how I feel about Troy Nichols, so... Yeah, I agree. I mean, he's my he's my second tight end in this class. I have Nicholas and Ebron close together, but I think that gun to my head I take Nicholas over Ebron just because. Nah, nah, I really like nah. I have, stop. Over, I have Nicholas over Amaro, and I have Ebron over Nicholas. I, I love Ebron. They've all got a top twenty grade though. They've yeah, all got I mean, a top like, twenty grade. I I'm, think I'm gonna Ebron throw that out there. is someone who has really, he surprised me this year. I was lower on him coming into this year than a lot of others because I hadn't seen my consistent hands. I bought into the Drew Michael Finley hype. He's better than Finley. He can block. He Mm -hmm. is much more dynamic down the field. He's much quicker after the catch. Much better than Drew Michael Finley than me. My my only thing is he's more of a wide receiver than a tight end, especially with how he's lined up. That's why he didn't qualify for the Mackey Award this year. It wasn't that they didn't want to vote him. It's that he didn't. They want Amaro or Ebron. I'm talking about Ebron. Oh, I was talking about Amaro. Oh, yeah. Sorry. But um, no, Nicholas is someone who he's so young. He like hasn't even cracked the surface of his potential yet. And I yeah. have. He'd be a first not... round lock if he declared next year instead of this year. Yeah. I mean, I it would be like that. Gronkowski. I really, he really reminds me of Gronkowski. And people are completely right. A healthier Gronkowski, too. Gronkowski was the most fluid athlete ever coming out of Arizona and had a flawless game except for injuries, which isn't true. You know, I don't think that Nick Lass is as fluid as Gronkowski. He was a tight end threat who could also block. He was no different from Nicholas. The thing is, he never played tight end until last year. He's been playing outside linebacker. He's been playing defensive tackle. He's been playing offensive tackle. And at yet, his school, he's an so offensive natural. tackle. He looks like he could be a special tight end. He and looks like he could be the kind of tight end who makes teams' offenses come together. Because if you have Nicholas on the field, because of his blocking ability, as we said before, it adds confusion to the defense. They don't know what you're going to do. They don't know if you're going to pass it. They don't know if you're going to run it. And he can dominate guys on his side. He's only learning blocking technique. He is only going to get better. And I've already seen enough from Nicholas in terms of the five games of Notre Dame that I've watched, because I like a lot of Notre Dame prospects this year, where I would feel completely comfortable spending a first-round pick on him, especially in this class. Because Troy Nicholas is someone who, you know, 
you might not get everything that you want right away. You might not get the instant investment. Like Arthur Lynch probably come in, start from team right away. Marcel Jensen probably come in, start right away, put up reasonable numbers. But Troy Nicholas, if you give him a year, let him learn, let him get reps. I think year two he could be a special tight end. In the NFL. I really, really believe that. Still don't think any of these guys we're talking about are as talented as Colt Lyerla. Well, has maybe, a on, maybe on the field, I agree, but off the field, is yeah, no, Ly- well, is going to go to prison. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's and that's not even like that that's not even like me making a joke. Like, he, he was busted with like, a lot of cocaine. Lyerla. Like he probably he's probably. I thought he. I thought he was going to. I feel he's going to do ten days, right? No, he's going to do the longest yard. <laughs> I mean, I, I really. I mean. I, I've I've talked at length about I mean I had Lyerle ahead of Ebron before the season and like talent alone I have him as a first round pick, but his, his character concerns are it's 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 bad. Um, so yeah, like I said, six, six or seventh round of Philadelphia, I'll take it. But um, yeah, I'm not. I mean, I'm not, I'm, would any of you guys take? Is it, this is a question to be honest? Like, so three sort of like typical tight ends. You got Austin Tafiri and Jenkins, Troy Nicholas, and CJ Theodorovich. Which one do you take last? Theodorovich. Uh, Safari and Jenkins. I go uh, Safari and Jenkins too. I agree with Ben. I don't, I don't, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna go with Scott on this one. This year. He Jenkins, Jenkins like, doesn't wow me as I mean he's like a possession guy. Uh, once you get into the um, once you get into the red zone. But like he's not exactly he's not really a dynamic receiver. I mean he can he can go up and get it, uh, but it's not some guy. I'm gonna. I, I don't think he's that versatile. I mean I, I think, don't think Theodorowicz is that much of a versi- of a dynamic receiver either. He's very I don't, versatile. I don't, he's a, I don't I don't think he's incredibly versatile. I think he, but he, I think he's a very good seam threat, uh, which is valuable for a tight end. He runs good routes. Yeah, Jay Jenkins was a deep threat in 2012, and then. Sarkeesian got pissed off at him for the DUI and cut his role back tremendously from what it was. He also looked completely out of shape this year. He looked like he was an awful kid. I, mean, I, he, I thought he gained like 20 points, to be honest. He, he, looked, he looked fat. He he's looked, he looked fat. Brandon Pettigrew is what he is. He's, I mean, that's his worst-case scenario. But I disagree with that. The worst case in 2012. Oh, in and 2012, he looked like that he was his Tony worst case scenario is Brandon Pettigrew. Austin Ferry Jenkins' worst case scenario is that he doesn't make it to the NFL because he starts the NFL in the drug program and then he gets caught again and doesn't end up playing. He won't start because in the drug program. He's not good enough to warrant keeping him on the roster if he has all this off the field baggage. We're living on the mythology of his freshman year where he made a few plays and he's like Rob Gronkowski, but since then. He's gained 20 pounds, he looks out of shape, and he's developed problems that might not be able to be fixed or might not be worth the team's time to be fixed because he's not very good. Um, so going back to Nicholas, uh, I agree with you that he's really raw. I, I really think he should have stayed because he needs to develop a little bit more. Um, at this point in his career, I think he's probably going to be a lot more... I, I, I see more um, Jermaine Gresham in his game than, than Rob Gronkowski. I could see a Rob Gronkowski-type ceiling for him, but I, at this point, you know, he's, he's very strong. He's very dangerous after the catch, but he's still very raw, both as a receiver and as a blocker. But, I mean, obviously the tools are there, but I think he should have stayed another year. I'm, I, I think he's a second-round pick because of how good his potential is, but I don't... I, I, I'm not completely sold on him yet uh, as a first rounder. I need to look more at him. I've only I've only watched two or three games. I think that's fair. I mean, I think also Gresham is another guy who put on too much weight once he got to the pros and he killed some parts of his game. He looked quicker at Oklahoma than he does in Cincinnati. So um, I, I think that that's another issue. But and my top five tight ends overall are. Nicholas, Ebron, Amaro, CJ, and Rogers. And I really would advise those who have not seen Richard Rogers take a look at him because I really like him. See, I have I have Amaro beneath Lynch. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, can we talk about the <laughs> Sorry. I just... Look, okay. Here's, here's my thing. Hey, let him defend it. Let him defend it. A tight end, okay, besides being a weapon, which what they've become, that's what they've become in the NFL, you have to realize that tight ends are also supposed to be safety blankets. And if my safety blanket can't make a contested catch, or can't make a catch uh, in traffic, then he's not a tight end. He's a big slot receiver. Uh, and that's what Amaro is. He's a big slot receiver. He's not a tight end. I mean, you don't, we don't see, I mean, he flashed the strength and the ability to be a blocker, and fine if you don't want to use him as a blocker, then he's not a blocker. But then he's not a tight end; he's a receiver. Um, <laughs> Lynch is is gonna, you know, you put him on your team. He's gonna catch. He, if you want him to, he he will catch a hundred passes for you in in, in a year. Uh, he's that kind of player. And yeah, that's been, you know, that's been devalued in today's NFL. But look, I mean, Jason Witten is still an incredibly good player, and it's just, just a matter of using him correctly. So obviously, I mean, this is kind of a lazy thing to say, and it and it matters for every single prospect, and it, you know, it changes schematically. Um, but I think Lynch is a guy that you could fit into basically any scheme, and he's going to be productive, and he's going to be good for you. Uh, you know, he's a hell of a blocker. He's a very reliable receiver. And when you look at a tight end, I mean, that's basically that. Those are the basic requirements you want from a tight end. The whole like dynamic aspect of it is. Uh, is like a second thought to me, unless of course, like their dynamic ability is so great, like Ebron, where it kind of supersedes, uh, it, yeah, supersedes that. And the thing with Ebron is he's still a good tight end. I mean, the whole hands issue, it, it get it got better. Uh, and at this point, it's not that like his hands are bad; it just needs to be more focused pass catching. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's all focus, not hands. He's made some crazy, crazy catches in traffic. His body control. And his mentality attacking the football is greater than some of the receivers. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's greater than some of the receivers in this class. He's insane attacking the football. And as a blocker, I mean, when you're talking about like a defensive end or an outside linebacker converting speed to power, he that's what he yes. does. As a blocker. And yes. He, he can play defensive end and play it very very well. Um, but I, I think Ebron yeah, is four plays. Awful. He got a quarterback hurry and two knocks. What? He played defensive end for four plays as like a freshman, and got two knockdowns in a hurry. Well, like, there you go. He's a freak. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he's six four. He's two hundred and thirty pounds. He is vertical. He's more than that. Uh, he's so probably mostly. a solid two sixty now. I mean, I will say Ebron was the one guy this year who I will say surprised me the most about how much he improved. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I did not like him in preseason. I had a second-round grade on him coming into this year, and I didn't buy the hype. I was like, there's no NN who's a first-round pick in this class. Like, they're all awful. And then I watched more Ebron as he improved, and I was like, wow, this guy got a lot better. I mean, I, the first game I watched live of his was when he – he he just did things that shouldn't be legal to uh, to to Miami, and I said, "Oh, he's yeah. he's gotten a lot better." And I went back and I and I watched and I kind of followed him throughout the year, and he he got very very good uh, or much better, and he really put his tools together. And he's there's still so much more, uh, you know. You get a, you turn him into a really consistent pass catcher in terms of his level of focus, and I mean you have. Uh, a slower but stronger Vernon Davis. I, I mean, I think he's phenomenal. Uh, but I mean, I definitely... I mean, let's talk about Amaro for a quick second because I got a little bit of flack for saying that I didn't have a first-round grade on him earlier this year. I just don't really see what everyone else finds to be so great. I think he's athletic. I like his hands. I think that he can break some tackles. He's better than Gator Hoskins, Scott. But I, I also, like, I didn't get the first-round hype. Some of you guys who like him more tell me why I should like Jason Mara more, because I have him with third end, but I, he might end up slipping on down my board if Richard Rodgers keeps on impressing me in tape, because I kind of like Rodgers a little bit more. Let's just say that... Um, let's just say that... It, I'd rather see Amaro as a wide receiver as well. well there Number you one go. wide receiver. He could be enough. Calvin Johnson as a wide receiver. Okay, calm down. Or Alshon at least. Yeah, he could at least be Alshon as a wide receiver. 
Okay, that's... I mean, he's probably going to post a faster 40 than anyone expects. If he's a 4-5 or even a 4-4 guy, it would not shock me. Calvin was 4-3-5. Calvin's a freak, but... I was just saying, in terms of the ridiculous catches, you may not be Calvin, but in terms of the large catch radius, the ability to go up there and get it, the, you know... Yeah, I mean, that's what Amaro is. Amaro is going to be, like, a basically a... It's just a big wide receiver that you're going to use in the slot, and that's completely fine. I just, I did, I'm not comfortable with labeling him a, a tight end. He's a Marcus. Let Cole. him, let him drop 30 pounds and just be explosive. Well, I, I think, I think part of his game. I mean, I, I, if he starts to use his body correctly, he could be a very, very good wide re- like player at that weight. I mean, uh, I'm not actually He's sure. He's like 260. Oh well, let him play at two two thirty. I think he'd be exactly. Great. Yeah, let him drop thirty pounds. He will be so much faster, much more explosive. Like short area quickness will be like insane compared to what it is currently. That's like, not going. You can't you can't, you can't just drop thirty pounds unless you're like. Start. Yeah, you can. You can just stop eating all the protein that you eat all the time. Exactly. Day. I mean that that's really what these guys do. They bulk up on protein and all sorts of other crap. You know, instead of doing that, just play, eat like a human and not like a, you know, a mass trying to gain, not like a guy trying to gain a bunch of mass, you know. That's what these guys do. They eat so much protein, they're just trying to, I don't know how to explain it. They try to incredible hulk themselves. Exactly. When I mean, he plays tight end, so I think his goal would probably be to get bigger, but. He's not going to be a tight end in the NFL, though. Well, no, 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 I, I agree with that, I, but. Okay. Um, like he thinks he is, but he's not. Y'all want to talk uh, defensive, defensive end. line? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Defensive okay. end. Yeah. Let's line. talk defensive line. Oh, I know. I can just something unpopular, but you guys go first. I have an unpopular opinion. Well, uh, let's start I, off with the unpopular one. Oh, I think D four is better than Jeremiah. Oh God. Uh, no, oh, no, 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 you're so. Oh, all right, I'll go on. I'll go on and let you explain why you think that, and then we'll just tear you. Yeah. So here's the thing with D Ford, and I have a few unpopular opinions on the line. I think that Aaron Lynch also is getting <laughs> underrated by a lot of people. Um, but D Ford, the guy bends the edge better than anyone in last year's draft class. He does. Last year's draft class sucked. Bends the edge better than anyone else, and. You know, Who was the best defensive end from last year's draft bit, class? Like, reticent because he isn't great at stopping the run. Vaughn Miller sucked at stopping the run in 2011. He went number two overall. I think that's a really bad excuse in the passing league to pass on a guy who clearly has the skills to make money where it matters most. And D4, to me, is somebody who was very undervalued in this class. He has really powerful hands. He really gets back into tackle sort of pads. And he's the kind of guy who will make offensive tackles fear him at the next level. Okay, so but I'm on the bandwagon now. I am on the D Ford first round pick bandwagon. And I like Jeremiah. I think Jeremiah Attitude is somebody who will be a first round pick as well. I'm definitely I'm still there too. I just think D Ford is a scarier, higher upside player. But uh, okay, well here's my question. Why would you take, like, okay, D. Ford is really good. I'm not, uh, you know, the more I watch him, the more I like him. But his game is just predicated on speed. That's all he does. He's speed, which is fine. You know, there is a place. Where he'll go to Jacksonville and, pl- and play Leo, and he'll be really, really, really productive there, and that's fine. But why would you take him over a player that's stronger, that's bigger, that can play the run better, and that can drop into coverage? I mean, uh, because why would you, I, I why think would the question's been sent that, I mean, Barkevius Mingo went six overall last year based on speed. Von Miller went number two overall based on speed. This is what this league's about. It's about yeah, I'm not saying that, that doesn't make it right. I mean, uh, yeah, Von Miller's obviously a great player, but... Yeah, Here's but I, I agree it doesn't make it right, but this is what is making an impact. I mean, Jeremiah Attitude's an amazing player. I really like him. I just don't think he does anything quite as well as Ford when it comes to actually pressuring the quarterback and getting results. Yeah, but we're pretending that Attitude's better than Ford. Attitude doesn't have speed. He's fast as hell. Does that really help when you play defenses that are predicated to stop and roll with the front core rather than Attitude off the outside linebacker position? Here's here's the thing with me. Attitude 
is much more scheme versatile than D4. He yeah. is, his first step is just as explosive as D4's. His angles are significantly better than D4's. His instincts are miles ahead of D4's. Like, his ability to, di to diagnose plays accurately is great. Um, his hand technique, significantly better than D4's, in my opinion. Um, better than D4's, but they're both kind of average. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that I either one of them has more great... powerful hands. I don't think that, that close. Ford has more they're powerful, more powerful hands, hands. He's got better yes. technique. Who cares? Yes, I mean, exactly. You know, um, it's about the same level. They're both average there. They I, both no, I think Ford's are better than people give him credit for. Ford is seen. better than people give him credit for, yes. Ford is a probably mid-second round guy. The issue here no, is that not. you're underrating he's a He's not a first round guy. He's not a first round guy. Yes, he does one I wouldn't thing. take him in the first round. Yes, he is. Why isn't he a first round he, Because he's a situational player. What? He can't play, he does, he he does can't play all three down. downs. He does one thing. He rushes the passer. That's it. Two he can't throw up into coverage. Four. He can't stop the run. A Tauch is a three down guy. Exactly. You have one guy who's going to play 1,000 so, plays next so, year. You've got one guy who's going to play six, six to 700 plays next year. What would I you rather know. take in the first I round? Push, the guy who's going to play 1,000 or the guy who's going to play 600? Who's going to pay $4 million a year? The guy who's going to play 1,000 or the guy who's going to play 600? That's what we're looking at here. Again, I don't need to, I don't need to talk money with three other Jewish guys here. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about... <laughs> Why is D Ford less valuable as a prospect than Marquis Mingo was last year? Because Mingo was a guy who literally Mingo was on number six. No, I wasn't. I wasn't really high on Mingo. I mean, Mingo should have gone in the early second round. Mingo got eight sacks. Mingo had a great the issue there, though. Is last year's draft was weak. That's why he went so high. So it's he's still a first round pick. I mean, yeah, he was I, a first round pick. Someone's that, gonna take D four at the end of the first round, get the same kind of production that the Browns got out of Mingo. Again, we shouldn't be looking to the Browns for proper draft techniques. All right, the Browns, the Browns are not the defense. example yeah, of proper drafting. Here. I mean, I'm just saying. Right, so. <laughs> I mean, I will say that the Browns have a lot of talented defensive guys on their on their team who they drafted. They do have a lot of talented guys. They have a lot of. They make a lot of mis They make just as many mistakes as they make good decisions. Yeah, if not more. Well, could we agree that Arkevius Bingo was a good decision? So I think it was pretty At good. six, no. With Jabal Shiard and no. who else would they have taken? Okay, good. Again, last year was not a great draft, but they could have taken a quarterback. Oh, Gino Smith would have been better there. Again, even with all of his struggles, all right, I like Smith would have been better there. I, I, I just think that in the way that the NFL is structured right now, D. Ford's the kind of guy who could be worth a big contract, even if he doesn't play as many snaps. That's fair, but why can you put him over a Tauchu? Because I don't think a Tauchu can play defensive end on a consistent basis. He, I think that's why he did it all this year. He played like 900 snaps this year at a defensive end in the 4-3 in the ACC at left end, not right end, at left end, the base end, the strong they side. Moved around. I mean, the way that I project him the next he level is played I mainly think left end, though. That's where he's best yeah, I, mean, I think he's a 3-4 outside linebacker. I think his best fit's a 4-3 strong side guy who drops down on the third downs and puts his hand in the dirt on the left side and looks like Cameron Wake more than... That could work, too. I honestly think that, and Von Miller. I think that the best way to maximize Jeremiah Atouch's potential is to put him at the wide nine every single play and just let him attack the backfield. Just let him take advantage of his initial burst and his instincts and his angles, and he's going to feast. And, and I think he can play strong side linebacker. Yeah, he can. I'm not yeah. disagreeing. I'm just saying I think that's where he's best. Yeah, no, I, 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 that's the thing that's so great about him. He can play any of those positions. I, he, I, he's really similar. You know, if you bulked up Bruce Irvin, you could get a very similar guy to what uh, a Tauchu is. Exactly, and that's another. Well, Tauchu is a lot better yeah. off the field than Bruce Irvin ever. Well, yes, a Tauchu is off the field. The guy's yeah, a fucking Tauchu saint. Also, oh, there's man. the whole age thing, which actually is a great point that people are bringing up now. 
the guys who dominated 21 and 20 and 22 as college seniors and college juniors tend to have better careers. Yeah, and Atau should just turn 21. Than the guys that are 23, 24, 25 mm -hmm. dominating at the college level. You got guys like Jeremiah Tauchi, who is 21, who did graduate, who was a team captain. Yeah. Honestly, if he goes top five, top six, it wouldn't shock me, especially if he kills it at the combine. You will. Jeremiah Tauchi runs a four. No, I, I think it will shock me top six. Because I'm I also saying. think that he's a really good fit for the Falcons. Whatever I'm not even saying the Falcons. I'm saying the Raiders. Again, a team that's going mean, to make some I've, crazy decisions I've every said year. That I think it tells you the Raiders. Top 10. I'm just not sure that he's better than D4 because four really does bring a lot to the table that Atauchu does. I think Atauchu, from only projectability, pure projectability, Atauchu is probably more projectable. But D4 and brings that's what the NFL draft is about, man. Edge bending that has gone top 10 in the past and could go top 10 again. Honestly, Atauchu's ability to his hip, ankle, and knee flexibility is just as good as D Ford's. But I think Ford has stronger hands too, and I think that's very underrated about him. That's fair. Ford's hands hand, might be stronger man. than just about any defensive ends in this class. Atauchu's length is significantly better though. Atauchu has the arms of like a six five guy. Agreed. But I also think that it's how she needs to fill out that frame a little bit more. So I think that he's up to like there's a lot of nifty something. Like two fifty. Right. I think that both of them are good prospects. I just don't see why you don't have a first round grade on D four. To be honest. Because six foot two, two hundred forty pound defensive ends don't tend to do very well in the NFL. No, D four is up to two sixty now. Player. But uh, for me, like I can't put D four in the first round because of the fact that he can't play all three downs. And he's not versatile. He can do one thing and one thing only. I think that's also, but that's, I mean, the three down defensive end, it's a myth that was sort of perpetuated in the older NFL. It's not how the NFL works anymore. I mean, now you can have every second and third down that don't have the insane running downs. And even so, I mean, D Ford's the kind of guy who's going to attract multiple blockers on rundowns and open up holes for other guys to make plays. You can compliment him. I don't think you're going to have multiple blockers on no D Ford because you can just trap him into the backfield every play, and he's going to fight every single time. I love how a Patriots fan is trying to say that there's no such thing as a three-down defensive end when his team employs the, the two No, I'm not saying there's no such thing as a three-down defensive end. That played 1,100 snaps this what year. What I'm saying is that there, you don't need to have a three-down defensive end to succeed. You don't need to have that anymore. You don't need to have it, but how much does it open up a defense to have a guy like Jared Allen or Chandler Jones or Lamar Houston? You know, how much does it open up a defense to have a guy who can play those thousand downs, who can play like a Carlos Dunlap, a 950 snaps a year, and play the run and play the pass and do it everything you cap space, It saves you draft picks. Like, a Michael you know, Thompson. Say, with the Patriots, at least, Chandler Jones was rotated inside the defensive tackle for at least half those snaps this year because of injury. So was Lamar Houston. But, like, that isn't a typical situation because on third down, those best teams are bringing in their pass rushers anyway. Okay, it's, not the, it's not the best situation out there, but it's Miami. the guy who gives you that versatility. That's what made Chandler Jones a first-round pick. Is Miami that, slides can't wait to the green tech. On, pa on, like, pass rushing downs on, like, third and long. Well, I mean, Cam Wake didn't even... Well, hold on. Yeah, Cam I Wake... Think Cam, I mean, Cam Wake is probably the best pass rush... Well, top three pass rushers we've ever thought to, so... Yeah, that's true. Okay, I have a question. What does D4 do better than Demarcus Lawrence? D4 is a lot faster than Demarcus Lawrence, and he's better off the edge. And he's what? Whenever I watch Marcus Lawrence, I know that Jinx agrees with me. He was slow off the edge. He was not a very quick defensive end. What does uh, D four do that Marcus I mean, Smith? He has a lot of projectability, but I didn't see anywhere near the kind of talent that a lot of other people saw in Demarcus. I don't Lawrence. know. He he's he's flashed. He's flashed ability to get off the line really quickly, and he's also a lot stronger than D four just all around. He's definitely stronger than D Ford because he's bigger than D Ford and he's more of a 
typical every down defensive end in D Ford. But I also yeah. think that Lord's a lot slower than D Ford, and I'm not sure that his athleticism is going to help him at the next level. I, I just don't think he's that athletic, to be honest. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't agree with that. I think that uh, I just think that he just needs the opportunity. He just needs to get coached up, and I he just needs to put what he does on the field consistently. I think what Ford does is what Ford does, and he does it very well. Um, but it's 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 one thing. While a guy like Lawrence and a guy like Atacho has multiple facets to their game, and both of them are nowhere near their ceiling yet. I'd rather have Shaq Barrett than D Ford on my team. I I would take yeah, me too. They play completely different positions. No, they don't. Shaq Barrett plays defensive end. D Ford Shaq plays Barrett defensive end. Defensive they end both play the weak He's side defensive end. Four three outside linebacker. Maybe Shaq Barrett. Shaq Barrett. You have side. not seen Shaq Barrett play. Do you think he plays a four three outside linebacker? He plays a four three defensive end. 90% of his snaps. He well, may he line up in a 3-4 every now and again, but he's a defensive end. He may stand up, but he's still a defensive end. A guy who stands up and rushes the passer is still a defensive end by okay. pretty much well, every metric. All right, what's so he doing? The defensive Josh end. Norris tried to pile the edge player title for like guys who play on the edge, which I actually kind of like. Um, but... So, so I, I'm going to try to be a little more comfortable using it from this point onward. But I don't think that Shaq Barrett and D4 for the same role because Barrett, to me, is a little bit more of a fluid and space type guy, and I think Ford's more of a downhill get to the quarterback type. Guy. I think that they're a little bit different. So one guy can play the entire position of edge player, which we'll say edge rusher, edge player. Hey, if you're an edge rusher, your job's get to the quarterback. That we'll just say edge. We'll just say edge player. Barrett can set the edge against the against the run. He can rush the passer. He is just as productive as D Ford, if not more productive. He's not going to be playing in the in the crap uh, the Mountain West with Colorado State, but still, you know, just as productive as D Ford in college. We're not but talking about. I think about that when you watch the tape, I mean, D Ford is quicker and he's stronger than Barrett. Barrett was, is a really good player. I think that what Barrett does really well is he's very instinctive. And we haven't talked about Aaron Donald yet. Give me I don't know if people want to, but I think that Shaq Barrett and Aaron Donald both have really, really good instincts when it comes to locating the ball, knowing where to be, knowing how to get to the quarterback, knowing where they need to be on the field to make a play. Uh, but I think that Ford, in terms of athletic gifts, is a little bit more than Barrett. And then if you go back to athletic gifts, what makes Ford better than a Tauchu? Ford's exactly. faster and he's stronger. He has a better punch. But he's punch not. Than he's not stronger. But he's not. Yeah, he has he's a not. better punch initially than a Tauchu. At least he really doesn't. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, what I I've seen with Tauchu is he wins with moves. He doesn't win as much with punch. And I've seen that Ford is a better punch. Ford owned the right tackle for Florida State the entire board. Because Atachu, because Atachu understands that he can beat a guy with a swim move a lot quicker than he can then beat a guy with a punch. Quicker. Exactly. But I mean, I'm not really still worried about guys that. with his punch. Ford is still mauling guys with his punch. It's not close. Okay. I mean, I you do know, think that did a study where Ford had a lot of sacks that were sort of given to him based on quarterbacks running into his pressure. And I think that that is a fair assessment to make, considering Ford. But I still think that at the next level, he is going to bring the pressure necessary to create quarterback hurries. Themselves. Because he has all the skills necessary to do it. His edge bend is elite. I mean, it is. That's great. He'll be the next Robert Mathis, then. Robert Mathis is a Pro Bowl And player. how long I mean, did Mathis it take him to get there? Him. To be honest, in terms Robert of... Robert Mathis is, what, in his 10th right. year and he's in his first Pro Bowl? He okay, should, yeah, but Pro Bowl he should have been at more. I mean, Mathis should have been a Pro Bowler at least five times in his career, if not more. Yeah. He's been a really, let's, let's really good pass rusher in the years. Uh, I mean, I mean Edwin Mathis just made his first Pro Bowl, so it's, yeah, it, that's not a thing. Just so we're, okay, yeah. let, let's look at his 10 sack seasons. How many of them were because Freeney was taking double teams and he was basically getting, you know, Kelsey Quarrel type sacks. 
I mean, I think math is better than How many of them were that? Most yeah, of his early career was math dumb. Is better than Freeney. Mathis got a very fair share of double teams. Freeney is a great player, but Freeney also won very immediately in Indy. Freeney won off the speed moves. Freeney won off the bolts. Mathis had to face double teams, and he split them, and he proved himself, even if he had a really good player with him. So I, I don't think that that is fair to Robert Mathis. Because Robert Mathis is a great player in his own way. And if D4 can have half the career that Robert Mathis does, I think D4 would be pretty happy. I just, I don't see it. I mean, I, 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 I don't see it with Ford. I don't see that he's, you know, he's a good prospect. He's a very good prospect. I just don't see him as better than a Tauchi. You see, to me, the one thing that you can't teach is instincts, and D Ford just doesn't have them. That's. I mean, I, I guess that just like. I think I think that D Ford's gift of being able to get to the court and be able to create pressure is enough from to warrant me to give him that chance in the first round over a Tauchi. I think a Tauchi first round pick too, as I've said multiple times over the past few minutes. Um, but we'll see. I mean, give me football we'll players more, with athletic more. potential like both of them. We'll see. over athletes with football potential every day. But Atauchu is an athlete with football potential too. No, Atauchu is a football player with athletic potential. I he's think he's a football for, player. I think he's been used everywhere and has shown that he's effective player. everywhere. I think it's unfair to call for just an athlete with football. Potential. But what else can he do aside from rush the passer? He's a one trick pony right now. No, but Ford's he's not an athlete team. with Ford football has potential. Because everything he wins with is his athletic gifts. Everything Atauchi wins with is a combination of instincts and athletic gifts. That's not true, though. That's a narrative that isn't true. Like, D. Ford wins based on his punch. D. Ford wins based on his ability to bend the edge. D. D Ford, Ford is just a worse Anthony get Ball. Past tackles. A lot worse. Like, yo, 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 he's yo, yo, not yo. just a guy who's running around. <laughs> well, that's not wait, what D. Ford's wait, wait, wait. doing. A that's lot worse than Anthony Ball. That that's, that's not true. That's that's not true. D Ford can actually bend like by himself. Anthony Anthony Barr is not good. D Ford is good. I mean, I, I mean, would take D Ford over Anthony Barr. I would I take D Ford over Anthony Barr as well. I, I mean, D Ford's not a bad player. I and I, I don't. I'm not really buying the whole. He's just an athlete. I think he's a football player. I just think that his his game is is one thing. He does, and, and like once again, he does it very, very well. And there's gonna be, he's gonna be a very good NFL player in that spot. I mean, at the very least. But like when I'm talking about drafting a guy, especially drafting a guy very high, um, you want an immediate impact player. And the fact of the matter is, Atauchu's floor and Atauchu's ceiling are both much better, in my opinion, than what you get from Ford. Because what you're getting from Atauchu is you're getting length, you're getting strength, you're getting speed. You're getting instincts. You're getting the ability to drop into coverage, and you get scheme versatility. Most of those things you're not getting from uh, from Ford. So for me, it's kind of a simple equation. But if you're running, if you're running a, a you know a four three under defense, and you need a, and you need a guy who's basically just rushing the pass, uh, you know, out wide rushing the passer in every single down, and you don't really care about like the schematic versatility aspect of it, which is, which is fine. You know, go for a guy like Ford. Ford's going to be very productive in that system, but I just don't see how he is better than someone as versatile and someone with the upside that Atauchu has. Jacksonville will love him at the top of the third round. That's what I'm saying. Second round, he ain't making it past the top of the second round. Well, then they'll enjoy him at the top of the second round where they, you know, where they pick. I, I just got to say one more thing. I am so fucking pissed at Gus Bradley for only giving a Tauchu 13 snaps in the senior bowl. All out of strong side linebacker. He let D Ford play what, like 40 snaps from the wide nine? And oh I my think god. He to say who he wants. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like he was just hiding a Tauchu, honestly. Like, if you put a Tauchu there, like, people think that D Ford had a great game. You don't even, like, people would have lost their minds if a Tauchu had played that role. I mean, I, I just think, and I'll end it with this, I just think that you guys are, to an extent, I think you're, 
I think it touches a little bit more of a project than people seem to think it is. But in terms of see. playing linebacker, yes. But at a wide nine, I think he's an instant club and play. I think in a scheme where he's used all over the place, like a you know, like a Jets, like a um like a New Orleans, again, like the Eagles. The Eagles would love him. 3-4 outside linebacker, rush the passer, cover the tight end, play the strong side, play the weak side. Just mess up. There are up. some players who, Sheldon Richardson last year, I think people overanalyzed him because they were scared about what scheme he would fit in, how it would translate to the NFL. But when you look at the tape, like all he did was make plays over and over and over again, and he just had a motor, and he just had effort, and he had ability, and he had instincts. That's just what he did. And sometimes, you know, you overanalyze so much you just miss sort of like what's right in front of you. And D Ford's someone who I didn't really know about until this year. And then I kept watching and watching the show every game I watched without fail. And I just don't understand why I didn't he to be honest. Because great. he's really good. <laughs> but um, one guy who I actually think might be have a higher upside than either of them is Aaron Lynch. And, you know, I, I think we talked about him before. This is a weird defensive end class. I like Taylor Hart, too. Ben and I have talked about Taylor Hart before. Um, but Aaron Lynch is someone who I'm intrigued to see how he does at the combine because I think he could be a first-round pick when it's all said and done. He He's got the Jufro going on. on. I'll give him that. Why? Yeah. Lynch? Yeah. Now I've got to search and see. Wait, what, wait, what did you say, Zach? I missed that. I said he's got the Jufro going on. I'll give him that. Maybe, but what, what he had going on for me is that he's basically played two completely different positions, succeeded at both of them. I mean, he was good this year at USF. He didn't have the stats to show it, but all the tape I watched, he really was pretty dynamic. I mean, he did a pretty good job. So, I, I, don't, I think that if he's on the right team... Uh, he's he's Michael Johnson. I mean, he is going to be a long-term starter if he gets a chance to. As long as he doesn't play himself out of the league by doing something stupid, I really like his upside. Especially in this class where I don't think after the top three, there are a lot of sure-thing first-round picks. I think that Coney Ely's a sure-thing first-round pick. I think he's a top-ten guy. Uh, all right. All right, you guys talk about Ely first, because I already got another my defensive lineman, so I'm going to let you guys talk about him first. Hey, guys. I just, uh, in trying to figure out if Aaron Lynch was Jewish, because someone said something about a Jufro, I found out that Aaron Murray... No way. Aaron, Aaron Murray's Jewish? No, not. His mom is Jewish. Oh, my God. Are you he kidding me? Aaron is a member of the tribe. Oh, no way. We've got to get him on a podcast. Or not a podcast. Well, a okay. we're, we're getting Aaron Martin. Is he Martin Mitchell? Who is Martin Mitchell? He's, he's in. He's in the truck. Wow. This can't be real. Oh, my God. He's Jewish. Aaron Murray's Jewish. Well, despite my fourth round grade on him, we can have him on uh, Confession Graphics hangout. I actually really like Aaron Murray, and and, th and this helps. It certainly helps. Yes. <laughs> I think he really improved. Uh, I mean, kind of going back to quarterbacks really quickly. Um, I really did not like him in the preseason, and then he was really able to improve his pocket presence, um, his accurate. I mean, his uh, his accuracy really improved too. Um, his decision making improved, I thought. And you know his his uh, his deep accuracy is honestly some of the best in the class. I would take his deep accuracy over Mettenberger, or Bortles, or any of those uh, a lot of those guys any day. But uh, yeah, he just was... needs to improve at making adjustments at the line and reading defenses, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree, I, and I think he could be a very good backup. And you know he actually has spotter potential. I think that uh, between uh, his just his ability and then like how he progressed from last year to this year and just what his character kind of tells me I think that it's it's possible that he could become a, a starter like a decent starter in a couple of years
unhealthy, he could be yeah. the top defensive tackle in this class. Um, I, I think he's kind of getting wolf forked. He's going to end up going in the mid to late first, and he'll end up being a seal for you who can get some. But Aaron Donald is so interesting to me because he is so aware on the field. He always knows which hole the running back is going through. He always knows where the quarterback is. He has awesome eyes, awesome processing speed. And he's quick and he's powerful and he has really good hands. But oh, he is not good against the row at all. No, he's not. I agree with that. He's worse than That's the thing I don't understand. I mean, he's he's been, I, I've really liked him since probably since his I mean, like since his sophomore year. Um and I was talking about I talked about him in the preseason and people you know, he's undersized and whatever, but he you know, he's really good at getting into the backfield, very very talented pass rush here. Uh, and he's really good at using his quickness. He's very tech, like every and with a guy like Donald, with a guy like Donald's frame, like every single play, he needs to be perfect in his in his technique. And he needs to be off the line before everyone else's. And he is. I mean, like everything he does technically is good, but he's physically limited, and and it really hurts him against the run. And I think I would spend a second round pick on him if I'm a four three. And you know, on passing downs, you put him at a three tech, and he he'll he'd be a very very good rotational defensive uh, defensive player. And like you said, you know, this is a passing league. You need pass rushers, yep. uh, and especially interior pass rushers. And I I mean I think he's very good at what he does, but you know his game is very one dimensional. Uh, and then going to Louis Nix, uh, I I had Nix as a top ten player in the preseason. Uh, his 2012 tape was very, very good, and it was just a matter of him getting, like, he wasn't playing healthy this year, yep. um, uh, which which hurt him, and, you know, he looked slow, but, I mean, he, he, he was a little bit heavy, and his knee was hurting, and, you know, when a guy who, who needs his quickness to win, when his knee doesn't work, is not going to be able to win consistently. Uh, I think he's too often miscast as a nose tackle. I think with, with a guy like his... His quickness, you want him, you want him uh, at a three or a one, where he's able to just kind of, you know, shoot into the backfield. I think he's such an underrated pass rusher. He's not as much of a space eater as some people make him out to be. You know, honestly, he's both. Yeah, no, he is. Like, I mean, he's, he's a three hundred and thirty pound.